Hello, my name is Adrian Yent from the CPFT communications team and this is the second in a series of podcasts. Today we are talking about treatment-resistant schizophrenia. My guest today is Dr. Emilia Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez is a consultant psychiatrist and lead clinician at CPFT's Clozapine Clinic. Welcome. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, Emilia, can I, can I ask you to f- briefly describe schizophrenia and the treatments? Yes, of course. Um, schizophrenia is what we call a, a psychotic disorder, something that affects around 1% of the population worldwide and is diagnosed because people present that kind of symptoms called psychosis, hearing voices or hallucinations. But it's not the only symptoms that people present. This, has, this is the way that we do the diagnosis. But people also present what we call negative symptoms, lack of motivation, lack of emotions, cognitive symptoms, poor memory, poor attention, and a range of other symptoms, including anxiety or mm, uh, drugs misuse. How is it diagnosed? Uh, right now, unfortunately, we don't have any particular test other than the clinical interview. That's how we get information or the diagnosis. We use all the information that we can gather through the clinical interview with the patients, with the family, with the relatives and the people around. And that's when we get the diagnosis. There is no particular test, blood test or brain scan that can give us the diagnosis. It, we do blood tests and brain scans just to rule out other, other explanations or the psychotic symptoms. What could be the other explanations? Oh, there's a range. Um, for for instance, if you are people are using an excess of drugs, illegal drugs, they, they might have some some psychosis. They also might have psychosis because of a brain tumor, epilepsy. Uh, people with Alzheimer's or with dementia sometimes start with the first symptoms are the, um, paranoia or or delusions. So there's a range of different conditions that may be causing that. So once you've diagnosed schizophrenia, what what are the treatments available? Uh, We have been very lucky over the last 15 years in UK because there has been a a huge push from the NHS to set up what we call the early intervention services. And that's uh, that's locally the CAMIO, which is an award-winning service and we have been working not only with medications which are basically antipsychotics but also with many other medications like antidepressants or mood stabilizer but more importantly with all the other with a range of interventions so from psychological interventions social support helping them helping people suffering with first episode psychosis to go back to work as as quick as possible or to reintegrate as much as they can as soon as possible so these are these Teams has been set up around 15 years ago, and uh, especially locally, it's extraordinarily successful. Can you describe what it might be to suffer a first episode psychosis? Awful. Mm. That's uh, that's a key question. It's mm. awful. Um, I can give you an example of one of my patients, for instance, someone who it took for her five years to tell me about the symptoms. I knew it was obvious that she was hearing her voices, but... Uh, she was at the university, stopped suddenly at the university and couldn't, nobody could understand why she was, she was stopping that. And you know, after a few years, actually five years, she finally mentioned to me that she has been hearing a voice continuously. Hearing a voice telling her something, but also feeling the hand, a hand grabbing her heart. And a voice telling her, if you disclose that you are hearing this voice, I will just grab your heart, you will stop beating and you will die. That must be extremely frightening. She was she was scared to death. For five years, non-stop has been like this. She finally managed to come over to uh, respond to medication, and now she's working full time and she's happy, very yes. happy. But it was terrifying for her for five years. And how do these antipsychotic drugs actually work then? Oh, that's uh, that's quite a a difficult question. Um, we know that there is a neurotransmitter, the way that they, the different parts of the brain communicate to each other, the neurons, that uh, is called dopamine. It seems to be elevated in people with schizophrenia. We don't know exactly the reason, what is, what is exactly happening, but we know that not only in schizophrenia, but in other conditions that um, include an increase of dopamine transmission, that leads to psychosis, hearing voices and delusions. So what we do is 
send some medications that block the dopamine receptor, so it decreases the activity of the dopamine in the brain, and that helps to control the symptoms, at least the psychotic symptoms, the voices and the delusions. So in the, the patient that you talked about, um, she managed to you know, recover herself um, and get better. Um, but what happens when people are resistant to these treatments? That happens quite more than we think. It's about 20-30% of the people who are resistant to um, antipsychotics, resistant for the psychotic symptoms, for the hearing voices. There are probably even more who are resistant to the other symptoms, the negative symptoms and the cognitive symptoms. But the, the people who are persistently psychotic is around 30% of the, of the group, between 20 and 40%, depending on what you... For this particular group of people, we have an, a different medication called clozapine that seems to be, oh, it's for sure, res people respond better to clozapine when they are resistant to any other antipsychotic. And how does clozapine work then? That's going to be complicated to answer. We don't really know how is that working. Probably works through um, pathways, so pathways for the other transmitters that control dopamine, let's say. So it's a bit higher up in the control, although we are not fully sure. There are many other explanations that might be ex uh, telling us how, why is that superior to others. The truth is that it doesn't work as the other antipsychotics, and despite this, it's better as a, for controlling antipsychotics. So that's also telling us how complex is the, is the brain functioning in people with psychosis which is not just straightforward, an increase of dopamine is much more complex than this. Now, Emilio, you've set up a clozapine clinic here, or a clinics, I should say. Um, can you tell me a bit about why you set it up and, and how you set it up and, and what, um, what effect, what benefits it's been uh, it's shown to the patients? Well, r rather than setting up, perhaps I, I picked this up. Um, it was set up uh, a few years ago, it was set up in the 90s by Professor Peter McKenna, who now has moved to Barcelona. He's a clever guy, and uh, where I'm from. <laughs> and and uh, but he left the trust around 10 years ago, so there was a gap of continuity in the care of the people with, with clozapine. So at that time, I was working at the university full time, and I wanted to do some continue to do some clinical work, and I thought that this group of people was very interesting for many reasons because it's, it's a large population with an unsolved problems and also as i mentioned earlier this has been a big push towards early intervention services that's the flip of the coin is that there has been less interest probably or less less funding for people with chronic psychosis and i i thought it was good to be there and helping as much as i could when you picked up the clozapine clinic um how, how did you how did you go about in improving patient care? Well, um, it, it was already up and running, but um, the, the particularity that we need to make you probably audience aware of is that clozapine needs uh, blood monitoring. So every month, people need to come to do a blood test. And because of that, people cannot be discharged from mental health services. Whatever happens, even if they recover, fully recover, they always with mental health services. Um, at the time, when I started at the Clozapine Clinic five, six years ago, actually we were just purely doing the monitoring of the blood test and not much. And many of the patients were um, less seen by the mental health services as they should, probably. So what I made sure is I, I transfer my clinics from the different facilities in the trust to the place where we're doing the Clozapine Clinic in order to... Um, make the doctor always available in case that something happened. And, and from there, for the first year, I was just learning how the clinic worked. I was raising concern to everybody, to the service managers, to the trust, to everybody, to make them aware that there was a huge population that we were probably not serving that much. And setting up what I thought that we should be doing. Um, that was the first year. Um, after the second year, I, my goal was trying to help to have the information really available to make clinical decisions. And that's what my, the database that I've been setting up, that's, that was the second, from the second year has been my main goal. And how does this database help you in your work? 
well, perhaps database is a bit is one of the aspects. Um, is I even consider more as a tool for developing what we call the CPAs, the clinical uh, program approach, the reviews that annually we need to do with the patients. So it's, it's a tool that helps me to make sure that all the information is in the CPA in an effective way, in a, um, in a comprehensive way, but also make sure that this information is um, sent to the electronic records for the trust, for sure, but also to a, a spreadsheet, a Excel file, anonymized, that can help me to evaluate very quickly what is my, my work, also to identify patterns in patients, to identify people with, for instance, in uh, have had or have developed obsessive symptoms. That happens occasionally with people on psychosis. So what, what, um, what was the difference to what was happening before? What did this, uh, this tool, the tool, enable you to do that wasn't able, you weren't able to do before, or perhaps did it make it easier, make, make the whole process quicker? Well, there are two... At, at the time, uh, there were still paper notes, so it's difficult to evaluate your service with paper notes, or you need to start every time from scratch. Um, soon after, we have the new electronic records called Rio, but whereas it's very effective in order to put all the information, it's extremely complicated to extract information from Rio. So you can hardly evaluate your practice there, or it takes a lot of time. Uh, to give you an example, I've been evaluating every every time that my patient comes to see me, uh, how many hours do they sleep? Because we know that sedation is a problem with, with clozapine. After two, three years of uh, gathering all the information, I check who have told me that they are sleeping less. So, And by identifying quickly who was there, I could identify what were the factors that make them sleep less, which were finding a job, reducing the dose of clozapine, but also adding a new medication. In this case, it was aripiprazole. So I knew that that was an effective, in, in, in my clinical practice, that was an effective uh, strategy to improve the sedation in the patients. So it comes back to the principle of early intervention, doesn't it, really? It enables you to make clinical decisions to as quickly as possible to improve patient care. Yes, oh, I would po- probably put that in a good clinical practice. So it's in a, in a clinical practice that you learn from the books, but also learn from your own experience and you improve from your own experience. Um, I think that that should be something that we all should be doing, but it's difficult without the tools necessary to do that. So you evaluate, you audit your activity and you improve from there. And that has been the cycle continuously. So is this something that other trusts could learn from, do you think? Well, I'm sure that there are trusts that they are more prone to innovation and there are other trusts that are less keen to innovations. I think that there are people who could learn from the idea itself of integrating research into your clinical practice. Uh, by the way, I, I, I wanted to mention, is this is my clinical research, let's say. Also, I thought it was very good to, I think I mentioned before or somewhere, somewhere else, that the, the three main components of the clinic were providing a good clinical care, making sure that we have um, this ability to do clinical research, but also helping and make strong links with the university in order to do um, basic research that we need to do in order to develop new treatments or new new approaches for, for the future. So I think that that's part of our commitment as a clinician should be the three parts, understanding what we do, helping um, our patients, but also liaising with the university in order to improve the long-term knowledge. Yes, because that, that's a key part of um, the trust's values is uh, innovation, is research. Could you tell me a bit about um, some of the research you, you've done, perhaps, or w- with the university or with partners? Yeah, well, I can, for instance, one of the... I can, I can explain something I'm, I'm doing. I'm particularly interested in uh, my patients, patients on clozapine, after a few years develop a checking behaviour, an unexpected obsessiveness that we don't really understand. So one of the things I've been um, evaluating the severity of the of the obsessive symptoms over the last three, four years indeed, and understanding what are the patterns, what are the reasons behind this. And just knowing or noticing that there are about 
50% of the people developing this. Because of that, and because I have identified quickly who are these cases, I discussed with our psychologists here, and they set up um, at least two cohorts of two groups of new cognitive behavioral therapy for treating these people with with uh, with obsessiveness induced by clozapine. So that's a that's a local, uh, that's a something that we do in house within the clozapine clinic. Has been a very effective. People um, perceive as you understand what are the problems, you understand what are the things that we haven't noticed before, and you provide some help. Uh, from the university point of view. Um, for instance, this obsessiveness has led to a collaboration with Professor Trevor Robbins, who is the former head of the Department of Psychology, an expert and, uh, you know, black belt in, in obsessiveness in the world. And he, he is now uh, helping to set up a, a more research project about what are the brain mechanisms associated with that. And we are starting this project fairly soon. But we also collaborate with other people. We collaborate with uh, Paul Fletcher for understanding what are the, how the how the delusions are formed in people with psychosis, or with now we're setting up a collaboration with the University of Oxford, with uh, Professor Masoud Hussein, who is a neurologist, who has a different approach about uh, apathy, which is a, one of the negative symptoms, lack of motivation, and he and he is studying apathy in people with Alzheimer, with Parkinson's disease, with other neurological conditions, and we were in contact because. I thought it was interesting to use his model to understand the apathy in my patients, and that's something that hopefully by the um, beginning of next year we'll be starting. So what do you think the treatment for schizophrenia or treatment-resistant schizophrenia might look like in 10 or 20 years? Oh, that's uh, uh, probably we will not have treatment-resistant schizophrenia by then, I think, or I hope. I think that... Um, the concept itself of schizophrenia is dividing probably is not is unlikely that it's only going to be just a single disease and probably it's a syndrome with a many other diseases inside and we need to be a bit better in order to differentiate the different contexts. Um, um, I have a lot of students coming with me and I ask them to sit with me to see 15 patients on clozapine, one after the other, or in two days, and each of them is different. So we have patients who are still psychotic, hearing voices non-stop for 15 years. We have patients who haven't heard any voices for 10 years, but they still have no motivation, and they have a lot of negative symptoms. We have others that actually they have complete remission and is working perfectly well. Mm -hmm. Some of the patients that have no psychosis, no negative symptoms, but still, but all of a sudden have developed uh, problems with obsessiveness. So there's a huge range of different um, uh, outcomes of the illness. That probably speaks that the the genetic background, the genetic um, milieu, or the, the genetic component of these patients are completely different to each other. In this context, probably, when we are able to identify different subtypes of the illness, um, not by the clinical features, but by the genetic features or the inflammatory markers or any other the markers, we could probably uh, do a much better targeting the, or personalized medicine. So in order to provide some patients with anti-inflammatories and antipsychotics, antipsychotics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, pure antipsychotics, etc. Thank you, Emilia. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to this podcast and to keep in touch with what's going on. Please follow us on Twitter, cpft underscore research. Thank you and goodbye.